Welcome to Salem Methodist Church, and we're all glad you're here. Isn't it great that summer's finally showing up? Um, this morning, if you take a look at your bulletins, there are a lot of there are a few prayer requests, and there are a lot of celebrations. Uh, the hands are sure getting into the act with a lot of good things coming here uh, this next month, and so we want to be sure that everybody also shares their prayers and concerns here in the next few minutes. Uh, I'm glad to be back here today. Sorry I missed you last week. Uh, I was down in Guatemala and experienced my second earthquake of all time. Uh, no, it was it, it, it was no big deal. They say they have five or six a year. <laughs> uh, it was quite uh, woke me up a little bit. Uh, it's really something. Interesting. It was. I was in Guatemala City, and it was up. The earthquake, if you heard, was up near the Guatemala-Mexican border, which basically just shook the bed and rattled some clothes in the closet. Um, so it was kind of an interesting experience. Uh, I don't want any more of it, though. <laughs> uh, now I'm going to come around and ask for everybody's prayers and concerns, and feel free to share, please. in the room a couple of announcements up here uh, we have an admin board meeting church council meeting on Monday so please send me any agenda items if you could please uh, I'd like to introduce my uh, sister-in-law Jeanette Benazdal who's in from Tucson Donna's sister and then we're going to have we're going to do the summer Marshall and star and I are going to maybe kick it off the the cyclist oasis over in the parking lot over here just we're gonna have a table out there water snacks Saturday mornings from I don't know nine to whenever they stop coming 11 1130 something like that and then uh, there's been an outreach from a, a cycling organization you know the major Taylor velodrome and you know, the very first famous athlete from Indianapolis in the 1880s or 90s something like that um, Eric how, how old is he I mean you did you know the guy no okay um, they're sponsoring a 32-mile bike ride and a 64-mile bike ride, and we're going to be a stop on that. Again, it's over in the parking lot, uh, and that's going to be the second Saturday of June. So we thought we'd do this, you know, Cyclist Oasis, June, July, and August, to try and do it every Sunday and just see if people stop, and I think they will. And you'll, you're welcome to join us. It's just going to be uh, sitting there on bag chairs, playing music, and drinking water. So feel free to join us if you have any interest in that. 
Share. Okay. Uh, about Stephen Taylor, he went in Thursday for his bone marrow transplant, but he's got to be in there for two weeks, and it's uh, very, very tricky. Uh, I don't know all about it. My sister's been informing me, but he's going to be in a lot of pain, and it's really, it's, he's not looking forward to it, but this is one thing he's got to get done. So he needs all the prayers in the world. Thank you. Uh, prayers for Andy this week on Thursday about noon. He's to have his uh, second knee replaced. Thank you. Now, while you're walking as well, um, I'll put a little advertisement for uh, Wednesday night. Start at 6, we eat a meal, a uh, nice little meal, and then at 6.30, we start our Bible study. Um, and right now, we're working on the book of Luke. And uh, um, so it starts at 6, and we start the Bible study at 6.30, and typically out somewhere around 7.30. So thank you. Everyone's invited. I'm Charlene, and last week I was unaware of two busy little bees that undecorated the uh, fellowship hall after our mother-daughter banquet, and Donna Ricketts and Mary Ann Holmes. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I asked for prayers for my friend Jess because uh, we had found out that one of her really good friends from home that doesn't go to IU had been diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. Um, but today is really exciting because I have praise. Uh, when Elena was first diagnosed, she was told that it was terminal and that she had basically less than 5% chance of making it through. And after further testing happened and uh, chemo, just hadn't updated us in a little bit because it wasn't seeming like anything was going to happen. And um, the day that I had you know, asked the church for prayers, literally the very next day, just told us that Elena was in remission. So she is so excited, I'm gonna cry. Um, but they were able to see that the chemo was working. Uh, they were able to shrink the tumor. And as of right now, Elena is in remission. So we are very excited for her that she now, you know, gets to live out her youth and uh, just continued prayers for her health and uh, everything like that. So thank you so much. Got a quick prayer request. Uh, our dear friends, before we joined Salem United Methodist, we were at Carmel United Methodist. I have a dear friend, not only professionally, but personally. His mother, uh, his name is Jeff King, so his mother Judy uh, could use some prayers. She had some uh, stomach ailments and she is getting up there in the year. So uh, prayers for Judy Kingston and Carmel. I would greatly appreciate it. Good morning. Uh, Tuesday afternoon, I had a telephone call from Virginia Crose, and she is doing well, still on restrictions, and won't be back possibly next Sunday, but maybe the next one. But she wanted me to relay to you that she thanks you all for her prayers. She said I could just feel them all day, and I know God was with me through it. So thank you for the prayers, and Keep her in your prayers. We had our kickoff first class for the Constitution class last Thursday, and uh, what an amazing time. People just kept coming in and coming in and coming in. And if you go downstairs, you'll see that there may be some, some, some chairs and tables that aren't like in normal places, but we had 41 people there last night, or Thursday night. And uh, I expect there'll be more than that this Thursday night. So it gets crowded down in a fellowship hall if you get that many people. But we're, we're making room, and I think everybody is uh, coming back. So praise God for that. Anyone else over in the annex? Just a reminder of a choir practice uh, right after service today, about 1045. Thanks. Okay. 
this morning our song of preparation is Sweet Sweet Spirit in the hymnal page 334 if you Good morning. Would everyone please rise and join me in the call to worship. <clears throat> the Holy One calls our sons and our daughters to prophecy. The Holy One calls our young people to see visions. The Holy One calls our elders to dream dreams. We come ready to dream new dreams. The Spirit of the Holy One is poured upon all flesh. We come ready to build our Spirit. Our hymn of adoration will be God of Grace and God of Glory on page 577.
will now turn to page 881 and join me in the Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. be seated. Our scripture lesson this morning is Acts 2 verses 1 through 21 from the Living Bible. And before I start reading it, does everybody know what a tongue is when we talk about flames? This is Pentecost Sunday and the, the flame, the flame that we can see is referred to as a tongue. And some like a campfire has many different little flames, tongues coming out of it. So that should help you understand this Bible verse just a little bit better. Acts 2, verses 1 through 21. Seven weeks had gone by since Jesus' death and resurrection. The day of Pentecost had now arrived. As the believers met together that day, Suddenly, there was a sound like a roaring of a mighty windstorm in the skies above them, and it filled the house where they were meeting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on their heads. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in languages they didn't know. For the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Many godly Jews were in Jerusalem that day for the religious celebrations, having arrived from many nations. And when they heard the roaring in the sky above the house, crowds came running to see what it was all about and, and were stunned to hear their own languages being spoken by the disciples. How can this be, they exclaimed, for these men are all from Galilee. And yet we hear them speaking all the native languages of the lands where we were born. Here we are, Parthenians, Mediites, Elamites, men from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia Minor, Phyagra, Pamphylia, Egypt, the Syrian, language of areas of Libya. They also were visitors of Rome, both Jews and Jewish converts, Cretans and Arab, Arabians. And we all hear these men telling in our own languages about the mighty miracles of God. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean, they ask each other. But others in the crowd were mocking. They're drunk, that's all, they said. Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen, all of you, visitors and residents of Jerusalem alike. Some of you are saying these men are drunk. It is not true. It's much too early for that. People don't get drunk by 9 a.m. No, what you see this morning was predicted centuries ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my Holy Spirit upon all mankind, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and the young men shall see visions, and your old men dream dreams. 
Yes, the Holy Spirit shall come upon all my servants, men and women alike, and they shall prophesy. And I will cause strange demonstrations in the heavens and on earth, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun shall turn black and the moon blood red before that awesome day of the Lord arrives. But anyone who asks for mercy from the Lord shall have it and shall be saved. This ends the reading of Acts 2, verses 1 through 21. Let's join together in prayer to our Lord and Savior. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come into your presence in your throne room. We come because you've invited us, and we come through Christ, our risen Lord. We thank you, Father, that you have made us welcome here. We thank you that Christ, the mediator between God and men, joins us here. Father, we thank you for being the God of mercy and the, and the God of never-ending love and never-ending forgiveness when we seek it. We give you thanks, Father, and we, we praise you for your faithfulness to us, even when our faith and trust has wavered. You're such a wonderful, gracious Father to us, and your love to each of us is unfathomable, but we continue to thank you for it. We realize, Father, the truth of the words in your word. Without me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. But it also says that we can do all things through Christ. And so, Father, we come to you today in the name of our blessed Lord and Savior. We continue to pray for peace to come to Israel and other parts of the world, and we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray that you will stop these wars and take out those who are ravenous wolves that are tearing things apart and who only want to destroy and devour. Father, we continue to pray for our students who are ending one phase of life and entering another era in their lives. Bless the students and their families and give them wisdom and direction for their future. May they remain faithful to you and to your Son, the Lord Jesus. Please, Father, continue to grant healing from surgeries and recovery from various illnesses for those on our prayer list and for those situations known only to you and those involved. Help us to completely trust you even when we don't fully understand what's taking place. Even so, we cling to your mighty power and love as we each face the uncertainties and the difficulties of life. We know that you are always present with us. You promised that you would never leave us nor forsake us, but that you would always be with us, strengthening us, guiding us. Hear us, Father, today as we join our hearts and voices to pray aloud the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Sacrifice is a word that we hear used quite often in Christian circles. Used a lot, but really seldom do we completely understand what it means. The OED, the Oxford English Dictionary, says of sacrifice, it is a voluntary giving up of 
of something valued, and it also constitutes a loss. There are a lot of experiences illustrating sacrifice, but one that moves me the most is an incident that occurred some years ago involving two wealthy Christians, a lawyer and a businessman. And they joined a group that was going around the world. Their goal was to complete a trip around the world. And in South Korea one day, they saw a field by the side of the road. And in the field was a young boy pulling a plow. And behind the plow was an, a very elderly man, his hands on the plow, guiding the plow as it goes through the rice paddy. The lawyer looked amused, and he took a snapshot of that scene. That's a curious picture. I suppose they're very poor, the lawyer said to the missionary, who was their guide and their interpreter. The missionary said, yes, that is the family of Chai Nauau. When the church was built, they were eager to give something, but they had no money. So they sold the only ox they had and gave the money to the church. This spring, they are pulling the plow, the plow themselves. The lawyer and the businessman were quiet for quite a while. Then the businessman said, that must have been a real sacrifice. The missionary said, they didn't call it that. They thought it was fortunate that they had an ox that they could sell. The two tourists didn't have much to say after that, but when they arrived home, the lawyer took the picture to his minister, told him about that incident, and then he said, I want to double my giving to the Lord, and I want you to give me some plow work to do also. You see, I've never, I've never given anything to the Lord's church that ever cost me anything. It took a converted heathen to teach me about that. As I think about that incident that took place in South Korea some years ago, it causes me to wonder, do I really believe what it says in the scripture? And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Let's think about this as we receive our morning offering. If the stewards will now please come forward.
thank you, Father, for the opportunity to show our love and to be reminded of your sacrifice as we present our tithes and offerings to you. Thank you in the name of Jesus our Lord, we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's children's time. Would anybody like to join me this morning? Hi. Hi. You want to come, Saul? All right. We have some visitors with us this morning. We have Mac, right? Did I do it right? And Soul. Soul shine. Soul shine. Okay. All right. We're so glad you're visiting Grandma and Grandpa and came to be with us this morning. Okay. Today is a special day in the church. Um, it's called Pentecost. I like to call it Wind Day. What do you think? Is that a good name? Okay. Did you hear Mr. Overman talk to us about it when he read Acts from the book of Acts, chapter 2? Okay. So, Jesus... Um, Jesus, pardon? Jesus, he went back up to heaven um, and he said that he was going to send something to the apostles. Um, and we talk about, um, can you see the wind? Do you see the wind? Hmm. I can't see the wind either, but we can see what the wind does, can't we? Yes, we can. All right, so if I, hold on, I got something to help us. All right, let's see. Here's one for you. Hold on to that. You got it? And a flower or a wheel. Flower or a wheel. Uh, wheel. Oops, I've got more wheels. Hold on. Flower? A wheel? A wheel. A wheel. A flower. Okay, now, now you're pushing with your hand and you can see that, right? But if I just if I just hold it here, it doesn't do very much, does it? What does it take to make it work? Wind. Wind, and when I push it through the air, the wind in the room makes it work, doesn't it? You have any of these in your yard at home? Maybe? It doesn't work anymore. Okay, well now you've got another one. Okay? All right. So, what I, I think the Holy Spirit is kind of like wind. Okay? We can't see it, but we know it's there. Do we know how it's working? Do you know how the Holy Spirit works inside of you? It's right here in your heart. God gave it to you. Because Jesus asked him to send it. And that's what Pentecost is, is celebrating and acknowledging that that happened that first day. It had been pretty cool to be there and see the wind blowing. And what else, what else did Mr. Overman tell us happened? There were tongues of fire. Now, I didn't have... Can you kind of pretend that this is a fire? You know, do you ever roast marshmallows over the fire? The flames are pretty colors, aren't they? There's orange and pinks and reds and blues. Okay, a big, fire. a big fire, okay. So, it must have been pretty awesome to be in that room and hear the wind and see the fire. It was, I don't know if it was quite this much on top of their head, what do you think? But it, that's what we're told, it was on top of their head. See, just like that. Maybe a little too much fire, that might have been a little too hot. <laughs> okay, so, how exciting. And I want us to be excited about the Holy Spirit today, okay? And every day, because it fills our heart and gives us the power of God to go spread the news about Jesus and bring other people to be excited and happy about Jesus, right? 
okay, what? Be, oh, careful, don't get each other's eyes, all right? Okay, okay. So, can we remember? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, I want us to remember to be excited about wind day. The Holy Spirit coming and descending on us and filling us with God's power. All right? Okay. Can you lay that in your lap for just a second? Can you lay it down? All right. We're going to hold each other's hands and say a prayer, and then we'll go to Sunday school. Okay? And you can take your wind toy with you. All right? Can you get, there you go. Can I have your hand? May I have your hand? Thank you. Okay, hold on. Okay, we're going to say a prayer. Stay right here with me. Dear Heavenly Father, what a blessing the children are. What a blessing the Holy Spirit is. Thank you for that wonderful gift. May we spread that power of the Holy Spirit every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, kids. All right, Ruth, can you? I'm glad Deneen gets to deal with those fl those wheels. <laughs> you might be looking at the scripture text that's printed in our bulletin this morning and thinking, "Oh my, that's a mistake. We we already had that scripture last week." Well, I assure you, nobody made a mistake. We we took an overview approach to that scripture last week. And today we want to take an in-depth look at this section, especially verses 2 and 3 of the scripture. So if you'll turn in your Bibles or your electronic devices, we'll read our scripture. The book of Ephesians, chapter 4, the first seven verses. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient and uh, hearing, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and there is one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Last week I shared with you a message that uh, tried to illustrate the importance of both short-term and long-term planning and preparing for the future. Today I want to talk with you about the importance of unity. You may have guessed that with last week's message, we began down a specific road. It's headed somewhere, and we want to develop that as we go through these next several weeks. This road will take us clear through till about August the first, first Sunday in August. Unity in diversity is a very precious commodity that may be used, but it also has to be treated with great respect. Much as you would treat a priceless uh, antique that is very fragile. There, there's a lot of aspects to the matter of unity. There's unity of the religious world, unity of purpose and many, many other aspects of unity. But today, I want to talk with you from the Word of God about the unity of believers in the local church, in the body of believers, the local congregation. Now, folk, this is another one of those times, like I mentioned last week, when I want everyone to hear what I'm going to say next. So, if you're sleeping, wake up. If your neighbor's sleeping, nudge him or her in the ribs. Because I want to be sure that you don't miss this. You see, I share this message today not because it's a serious problem in this congregation, 
I share it not because you are disunited, although it is a serious problem in many churches today. But I share this message with you because unity is one of the strengths of this congregation. And I want you to realize just how important that is and how important it is that you do what our scripture today says, that you make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. We want to be sure that we don't lose that unity in our congregation. We don't want to lose neither the unity nor the diversity. Both are of equal importance. And yet, like so many precious things in our lives, we can take it for granted and, and lose it without intending to. Just being together, or just saying that we're united, or even just uh, wanting to be united, that doesn't make unity in the body. So, I want you to think with me this morning from the scriptures about this matter of our internal congregational unity as we consider the subject love. Love, the perfect bond of unity. Let's ask God's blessing on this message. Father, we ask that you would give us minds, ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts to obey as we learn from your scripture today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm sure it will come as no surprise to you when I say that we live in a very fractured society. Relationships at every level are, are breaking down. The oneness that God intended marriage in marriage is mocked by the tragedy of divorce. Communication within families is there there it's it's just it's just smothered by uh, exasperating parents and rebellious kids. Church fellowships are cold and impersonal because the members have insulated themselves from one another as a result of offenses and grudges. The Christian world is divided into warring factions and these often are, are not the result of doctrinal differences but the breakdown of Christian graces that prevent people from having a rational discussion about these differences. If we are to be the people of God today, we, we need to be a people with wholesome and harmonious interpersonal relationships. Our own spiritual survival, to say nothing of the growth of our congregation, demands this. We need to develop a close relationship and fellowship within the family of God so that we can minister to each other. You see, in the final analysis, biblical unity is, is relational. What I mean by that is it's attained, it's maintained, and it is either lost or kept because of our interpersonal relationships or the lack of them. Let me give you some examples. Can we really pray on the deepest level for those that we really don't know personally? I doubt it. It's usually what we call shotgun prayers. Lord, bless, heal, save, whatever it is, you fill in the blank. All those about whom you know, but we don't know. James, in his letter to the Jews who were scattered about among the nations, says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now, will we be able to do this with a stranger that we don't trust? I, I doubt it. Will we be able to accept correction from those that we see as distant and disinterested. I doubt it. The fulfillment 
of the family of God commands in the scripture require that we live in close relationship with one another. But it seems like that when we begin to get in the script, to get close to one another, we, we seem to be able to get just about so close, and then our differences, our idiosyncrasies, our sins, drive us apart. Someone has described human relationships like two porcupines coming together. They can only get so close and then until each one of them, their quills begin to stick each other and they back off. How can we ever experience, appreciate, and obey all that God has called us to in the family of God? Behaviorists who study people's behavior have observed people of all ages, but especially school-aged children. And, and now they're sharing with us many lessons that they have learned from their observations of, of children in the classroom especially. And from those observations, there are several simple yet profound lessons that we can learn. And these lessons can help us in our relational problems that lead either to unity in diversity or to disunity. Behaviorists have observed that there is a principle in operation in human behavior that we must learn to recognize and accept. Most people behave in a manner that makes sense, at least to them at the time. I want to say that again because I want to be sure you hear this. Behaviorists have observed that there is a principle in operation in human behavior that we have to learn to recognize and to accept. And that principle is this. Most people behave in a manner that makes sense, at least to them, at that time, most of the time. For example, teacher, why are you chewing gum in class? Student, because it tastes good. For all purposes, the conversation is ended right there. The teacher received an honest answer to the question. Teacher, why are you smoking in the boys' restroom? Student, because I like to smoke. Teacher, why don't you have a pencil for this test? Student, I forgot. You see, when only the question is considered, the teacher cannot argue with the answer. And to scold or harangue because of such answer is to ignore the greater cause of teaching honesty and courtesy to the student. Now, out of this are some lessons for us in the church. First of all, asking why a person does whatever it is, is a conversational dead-end street. Unless we are emotionally disturbed, we tend to behave in a way that makes sense to us, at least the time of the behavior. And when we disagree, I need to realize that your point of view makes sense, at least to you. And you need to realize that my point of view makes sense to me. So therefore, instead of attacking you as a person, I need to probe for the reasoning behind your actions or your answers. Now, folk, listen. What we usually do when we disagree is to write each other off as stupid or unreasonable. And we decide we're just going to avoid any contact with that person. We just decide we're going to ignore each other. Now, a third lesson that we can learn is that it is much better, much better to make a positive statement about what we regard as someone's incorrect behavior. 
Here's an exaggerated example of what I mean. Someone misses a church service. It's better to say, we really miss worshiping with you Sunday. It's just not the same without you. Rather than saying something like, you dirty, low-down, yellow-bellied, backsliding, good-for-nothing so-and-so, where were you Sunday? Now, now I, I know none of you would, would say that, but I think you get what I mean. You approach someone like that, and you'll either get a lie, or you'll get an honest answer that's much harder to deal with. Or maybe you'll even get a punch in the nose. You see, to achieve and maintain the bond of unity in the wide diversity that people bring together in a congregation of Christians, we need to hear and then heed the commandments of God in the Bible that will enable us to experience the unity of the Holy Spirit even in our great diversity. Let's look at some of these commands as we find them in our scripture for today in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 4. The first one, verse 2, be humble. It says be completely humble. You see, being a Christian means that we're in a living relationship with God and with each other. I don't know how many of you watch the evening news at 6.30 on NBC, National News, but I do per periodically. I, I make it a practice not to, I, I think nobody should watch too much news. That'll drive you batty. But, but I watch it once in a while. And, and Lester Holt, the anchor, always closes his nightly newscast each weekday by saying, Please take care of yourself and each other. Our relationship with God and each other is entwined. I want you to listen to what the John wrote in the first, his first letter, John chapter 1, verse 3. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this, to make our joy complete. You see, our relationship, we, we, we can't have fellowship with God and ignore his other children. Neither can we grow into a close fellowship with our brothers and sisters unless we have experienced the same thing with our Lord. Now, it's relatively easy to enjoy a relationship with God if we're not living a sinful life. You see, he's perfect, and we're not. But it's quite another thing to be able to develop interpersonal relationship with God's other children because, because none of them are perfect, and neither are we. And so that's why the Holy Spirit gives us this word of instruction in our scripture for today. Be completely humble. When we consider our brothers and sisters in the Lord, it's so easy to fall into a pharisaical trap of comparing ourselves and concluding, well, I'm more, I'm more mature than so-and-so is, you fill in the blank. Or, I wish he, or I wish she, I wish they wouldn't do whatever it is you wish they wouldn't do. My wife's brother, when they lived on the farm growing up as children, down the road in the next farmhouse was a boy about the age of my, my wife's brother. His name was Timmy. And my wife's brother would always say when he was doing something he shouldn't, he would say, well, at least I'm not as bad as Timmy is. He was comparing, he was doing what the Bible says, comparing himself with another person. We should not do that. Because when we do that, that implies that we are, we're far beyond such behavior that Timmy's doing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul wrote, So if you think you are standing firm, 
Be careful that you don't fall. This is, an, this is an admonition that should help us to be completely humble. Pride is the attitude that rears its ugly head to cause us to elevate ourselves by looking down on someone else, our brothers and sisters. Paul also admonishes us in Romans chapter 12, verse 3, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. You see, and, and if in fact, if we have moved beyond our brother's irritating habit or our sister's besetting sin, is it because of our efforts alone? Or is it the character of Christ being shown in our lives? How long has God been working with you on that stubborn problem in your own life? When we realize and recognize that all we are is a result of God and others working on us and in us, then we will be completely humble in our attitudes and our actions with our fellow Christians. So, be humble. Number two, be gentle. Gentleness, that's verse two. I call it verse 2b. You see, hand in hand with the command for complete humanity, humility is the command for complete gentleness. Gentleness or meekness in some translations, it's an attitude of the heart that begins in our reaction to God and it shows itself in our interpersonal relationships. You see, uh, for example, self-assertiveness is the byword of today. Our kids are told and taught to be self-assertive. And so a quiet, mild-mannered, milly milk toast is encouraged to enroll in a class to learn to be more aggressive, be more assertive. But gentleness or meekness, it's not. It's not to be associated with this kind of weakness. The Bible humility, the Bible meekness, is to understand, be understood as power and strength under control. Did you get that? The Bible meaning of gentleness or meekness, it is power and strength under control. Whether it be a person that has enough muscle to knock me into Hamilton County, but the person seems so gentle and gracious. Or an intellect that seems to understand Einstein's theory of relativity, but he doesn't make you feel like a dum-dum in his or her presence. These are examples of strength and power under control. Just as our Lord did not assert himself to demand his rights and to claim to what was his rightfully, his followers are to yield rights and surrender what we could demand. Gentleness means that we accept God's dealing in our lives without much arguing or struggling or resisting. Now, folk, don't misunderstand. I'm talking about God's working in our lives. I'm not talking about what people may say or do. All of us who claim to be servants of Christ are to submit to the claims of Christ on our lives. Be humble. Be gentle. And thirdly, verse 2c, be patient. Complete humility and gentleness Demand that I be patient with my brother and sister in the Lord. And also even with those who have not yet accepted Christ as their Lord. There was a guy at a prayer meeting one time, midweek prayer meeting. They were in a circle. They were, each one was taking a turn praying around the circle. 
when it came to this guy's uh, turn to pray, he prayed this way. Lord, give me patience, and I want it right now. He sort of missed the point of patience, didn't he? <laughs> the impatience of our society is expressed in the marketplace as we see the rising demand for instant commodities. I mean, we want instant potatoes, instant gravy, instant soup, instant coffee, instant tea, instant breakfast, and we want instant relief when we eat instant foods too fast. We demand instant sound from our radios, televisions, recording devices, music players, cell phones, and organs. And so the switch from tubes to transistors. That speaker over there has got tubes in it, I, I'm told. It's outdated. <laughs> it, it, it's no wonder. No wonder at all that we have come to expect instant maturity in our brothers and sisters and in ourselves as well. Patience. If you read Galatians chapter 6, patience is a part of the fruit of the Spirit. And we cannot command ourselves to show more patience or to muster up an extra measure of patience for an irritating brother or sister. We have to connect ourselves to the vine, which is Jesus, and allow him to produce his fruit in our lives. And that takes time. Next Sunday morning, we begin a new series on uh, John chapter 15, the vine and the branches, where Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. We're going to begin a, a new series next Sunday and teach you that on what I'm calling the not-so-secret secrets of abundant living. Number four in our text that we read, bearing with one another in love. That's one of the hardest one of the hardest. You see, you see, life in relationship with another person or persons requires our bearing one another in love. Paul wrote in Colossians 3.13, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. The scripture connects bearing and expands bearing to include forgiveness as well. And so, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Can I forgive as the Lord forgave me? Maybe a better question would be, can I understand and appreciate how God has forgiven me unless I forgive and express the same in the family of God? The reality of God's forgiveness to me activates and empowers me to do the same in others. Any interpersonal relationship will experience offenses, some accidental, some intentional. And so bearing and forgiving are essential to any long-term relationship. It's no wonder then that Jesus was so dramatic and precise in his teaching on forgiveness. Now, the question then rises, how, how far are we to go to maintain unity? Chapter, verse 3 of our chapter says, make every effort, that's the command, make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit. God has spared no effort in making us one, united in Jesus. And we can omit no effort in maintaining that oneness. And to do that, it will require every effort, believe me. We can never do it on our own, by ourselves. Being completely humble, gentle, patient, or bearing with one another in love. These are not natural human tendencies. They come only by 
committing ourselves to God to do what he says in verses 2 and 3. And allow him to be the Lord of our relationship. It is clear from scripture that God has called us to unity. And what God has called us to do, he will bring to pass as we yield to him. So we conclude from our scripture text for today, as well as from other scriptures, that there are few, if any, legitimate reasons to split and divide from our Christian brothers and sisters. We may conclude that by following these scriptural guidelines, division about over non-scriptural reasons can be prevented. And the results are twofold. Number one, fractured fellowship for unscriptural reason results in a millstone of a burden hanging from our heart. But an offense forgiven, or a grudge forgotten, or a disagreement settled, will bring joy and peace to the heart of the individuals involved, and it will even bring peace to the whole congregation, the body of believers. The reality of the incarnation of Jesus Christ will be displayed to the whole world. And then, what Jesus prayed for in his prayer before his conviction, that they may all be one, as you and I are one, that will be fulfilled. How, how in the world can the whole world believe that God will forgive them if they see believers who are so stubborn and proud and demanding and short-tempered that they can't forgive each other? But when the loving forgiveness of God is released in our interpersonal relationships and in the church as a whole, the world will see that the Father has sent the Son and that the church is really what believers have claimed for her all along, the body of Christ on earth today. May nothing ever hinder us or prevent us from making that witness to a lost world. Nothing should hinder that. Not the deceitfulness of sin, not the wiles of the devil, not the hardness of human hearts, not the stubbornness or the pride of life. Nothing should prevent us in the church as demonstrating to the lost world the love of Christ and what that love can do. Let's pray together. Father, it's a, it's a tall order that you've given us. But the good news is that you've given to us the Holy Spirit indwelling us that we might be able to follow the teachings of your word. And not only have you taught us in your word, but you sent Jesus to show us how it's done. And so we can read Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, and we can see how Jesus did it, and then we can make it our goal to strive to be like Jesus. Father, we recognize that the truth of what you said, without me you can do nothing, but it's also true what you said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Father, strengthen us to be good examples, to continue to be the example to this community that this church has been for so many years. Bless us, Father, we pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's turn to page 557. Blessed be the tie that binds and stand and sing all verses. And let me ask you, pay special attention to the words of this song.
today as we depart from this place, I, I challenge you to uh, give ourselves to the challenge that God has given us in Ephesians chapter 4 to love and preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of priests. That's our choice. That's your assignment, not just for this week, but for every day of your lives. And I'll hear this benediction from Jude's letter. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Thanks for coming. God bless you. Live as Jesus would have you this week. Thank mm -hmm. you.